All right, welcome to another episode of Protect Your Educational Solutions Podcast, One Door at a Time, where we talk about the intersection of community, politics, education, and business. When we wrapped up a couple of weeks ago, we thought that we were actually wrapping up with season two, uh, the political edition, uh, but things change. You have to be nimble. And we had an opportunity to um, amplify the voice that is absolutely necessary, not only for the community of Baltimore City, but for Maryland and, uh, uh, in whole and the United States. And it is my distinct privilege, and I say that frequently, it's not hyperbole, to invite and have as a guest our Democratic nominee for Senator for the State of Maryland, Ms. Angela Osterbrooks. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you so much to you, Dr. Heber, for, uh, for facilitating today. And then to my brothers and sisters of the Divine Nine. My God, I'm so grateful to all of you for coming out today. It's an honor to be here, to be able to discuss the race, which is one of the most important races in our country. It is the race of a lifetime. Uh, this is the one that will determine not only the future of our country and our state, we get to decide not only the kind of state that we want to raise our children and grandchildren in, but this will determine the kind of country we want to live in as well. And it is also about our freedoms. So I'm really honored, but nobody does it better. Let me just be clear than the divine nine. Uh, we just faced a primary election where over $70 million was spent in that election. And the brothers and sisters, I have to tell you, they, there was a tsunami that happened at the polling place. Yes, yes. That was about the divine nine who came out to exercise our right and also the obligation that we have set out by our ancestors mm -hmm. uh, who made it possible for us to vote. So it's an honor to be here to discuss this, uh, this election. Absolutely, I, I, I wanna echo that. You know, we always talk about the why, the, the, the drive and dreaming with audacity. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about like who, who is Angela? What makes Angela tick, drives your passion? What, you know, the, your early, the early beginnings. Tell us about you. So, you know, I think all of us are the sum total of our experiences. Uh, for better or for worse, we really are. And when I think about who I am, it's hard to think about who I am without remembering those who came before me. Mm -hmm. You know, I think for example, um, about my grandmother, her name was Leah LeBright. And, uh, and by the way, don't tell my sister, but I was Lily's favorite granddaughter. <laughs> um, and I learned from her truly what public service looked like so early in my life. Um, she was a woman who worked as a housekeeper. Um, she'd often take me to work with her. She worked cleaning dental offices and, and cleaning homes. Um, but she was also a person who in her neighborhood was a leader. She was an unelected official, let me just mm. say that. Um, but what she did, for example, was she was a Southerner. My family's, my grandmother's from Seneca, South Carolina, my mother's sure. family. And she, those Southerners from South Carolina can cook. So she'd cook great food and put it in styrofoam containers mm. and then tell me to call. Uh, she'd say, for example, go get Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole was a person who was an army veteran. Okay. Um, he suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder um, and had some challenges. And she'd prepare a hot meal and tell me, go get Mr. Cole. By the way, she called him by his last name. She'd tell me to go get Mr. TC, who was a person who suffered with alcoholism in our community, mm. and say, tell him his dinner is ready. But these are people she treated with great dignity. She was happy to serve them. And she really stood as an example to me. What I think all of us ought to know is that we all have an obligation mm. uh, to do what we can to improve our environment, whether you're recognized for it or not. Mm -hmm. But that was the kind of upbringing I had. It was reinforced by my parents. I'm the proud daughter of a woman who served as a receptionist for her entire career, one of the finest women I have ever known. Uh, my father was a newspaper delivery person and a car salesman. Wow. And together they have really demonstrated for me and modeled what hard work looked like and struggle, and it has taught me to love all people. And so this has been an incredible journey. Um, I know that every person in this room, we all want the same things for our family. Absolutely. And I've been working to make sure that we get it. And it is important in this moment that we be seen. Because let me just say this, and I know we're going to talk more about the Senate. There are not enough of us in the Senate of the United States. Yeah, that's good. Uh, with that's our good. Yeah. Yeah. most experiences. 
And I want a person on the Senate floor that when they're talking with conviction, I want them to be talking about Leela Bright and what her needs are and the needs of all of our families as well. And I intend to represent all of our families in the Senate. Absolutely. So as you're going through that journey through public service and you're dead in, what are some of the lessons that you learned, some of the things that, uh, the stories that start shaping and what your, those stories, what the, those stories will uh, bring you into the next chapter of your public service life? So, you know, when you talk about some of the lessons I've learned, some of them, again, were um, lessons that were taught to me by my family. I remember two things that my father said. Um, he used to say to me as a kid, you know, I want to make sure that you never confuse education with intelligence. Mm. And, um, and what that taught me was to look at the potential in every person without respect for that person's pedigree or background was to find value. I can see brilliance, whether the person's educated or not, that's important. He also told me, he used to say, you know, do you know the problem with people? He calls me little fella because my father wanted sons and he didn't get them. So he <laughs> refers to me as a, a little fella. And he'd say, do you know the problem with people? And I'd say, what is it? He said, they know more than they understand. Mm. I think we're charged with, with approaching life by trying to understand the underlying circumstances. So for example, you might see a person's condition and rather than asking what's wrong with a person, we ought to be asking what happened to that person. Mm. Um, and so that's been a lesson I've carried forward is to continue to ask that question. And I think when you're asking not what's wrong with someone, but what happened to them, you get closer to the solution. And that's what I, I have learned. And it's been very helpful to me in my, in my time in public service. And you know, and I'm thinking about it in our brief conversation walking up here, it's your approach and the fact that you're approachable. The fact that so many people came together so swiftly to put something like this together uh, and that you took your time out in, in the middle, in the middle of campaigning to be able to get this together, it shows, I mean, it's, it's really a reflection on who you are and that you've never lost that and those early things that have been instilled in you. So as you're thinking about what this election looks like, mm -hmm. what is your vision for Maryland and then for the country? Well, you know, so my vision for the, um, for the state, first of all, has been really formed based on my experiences with people. The one thing I know, and I've come to understand this no matter where I have gone, is the thing we ask of our country, first of all, is economic opportunity. Uh, not all of us in this room believe and desire that this country ought to provide us the opportunity to care for our families, to do so with dignity, with growing jobs and income. We want to be able to provide for ourselves. And so one of the things that will be a priority for me is bringing back the kind of resources that allows us, in other words, you know, well, I've met many people. I was a prosecutor for, for mm -hmm. years. I started as a domestic violence prosecutor. And I'll say it this way. There were people in the courthouse who were seeking second chances, who I came to realize had never had the first chance at success in this country. Wow. And by that, I mean the kinds of investments in our education, the investments in allowing us to buy houses and to own property, to invest in our businesses, to have minority businesses and local owned businesses where we have capital for our businesses. Mm -hmm. In other words, I don't look at our communities and, and imagine what it's like for us just to exist on the margins. I want wealth to grow in our communities. I want us not just to survive, but to thrive. And that's a whole different perspective perspective, mm -hmm. that's what I'll be doing is bringing back economic opportunity, looking to invest, uh, again, making sure that we're growing affordable housing. You know, my parents married at 21 and 23, oh, and wow. five years into the marriage, they could afford a modest home. Unfortunately, that is not the case for too many people in our communities. And so we have got to find ways to make home ownership, which, by the way, is where many people's wealth develops, yes. a real possibility for a, a number of us, affording health care and preserving our freedoms, our rights, our freedoms. Let me just say this, anyone who does not understand yet what we're talking about in this election, when we talk about freedoms, let's just, let's just think back to what it felt like to have that man in office in 2020, the one who called African countries shithole countries. Let's remember what that felt like, how, what the kind of regard or disregard that he has for every one of us. So when we talk about voting rights, we talk about all of the freedoms that, that want to be rolled back one after the next. Mm -hmm. Trust me, they're coming. You know, a woman's right to choose. Um, you know, our, not only our, reproduct, our reproductive freedom, who should tell us about contraception mm -hmm. and IVF and be an examination when we want these politicians, mm -hmm. when we 
are making tough decisions. I have a 19-year-old daughter. When you said, who am I? I should have started with that because, you know, I'm one of those mothers. Mm -hmm. I got a 19-year-old, and I'm unashamed to say, you know how we feel. I think she's the best to have ever done it. She's a uh, freshman at Spelman College. Okay. She's a freshman young woman. And I want my daughter to make her own decisions. You know, our young people have fewer rights, these young women, than their grandmothers. Yeah. There's something wrong with that. So if we want these politicians to get not only get out of the examination room, don't be in the waiting area either when we're making decisions about our bodies. Wow. So you're crystallizing it about the importance of this election, that it may be the most important election in, in history. Yeah. How can we galvanize uh, not just the divine nine, but yeah. the African American community in general about how important this is about and getting out and voting, no matter what the weather may be, no matter what obstacles uh, uh, that they, they, they may experience. How would you suggest that we galvanize even stronger? Yeah, well, I think you know what it is never forgetting. Mm. Let's just say that again. We should never forget where we have come from, and our grandmothers and and grandfathers were not wrong about it. The ones who stood in line, the ones who jumped in front of water hoses and dogs and barking dogs in order for us to vote, they were not wrong about it. They understood something that's important to us uh, in, in order to do that. You look at these uh, people who have, look, think about South Africa. The first year they could vote, they stood in line for 13 hours. They were not wrong about it. They understood the power of the vote. And again, in this election, I want people to be clear about what we're talking about here, in the Senate in particular. It's very simple. There are people who are saying right now, I like Larry Hogan. I like Larry Hogan, and that has nothing to do with anything. The point is, this election is about the 51st vote. It is about who will control the Senate, and thereafter, who will control the agenda for this country. We have to, the, the Senate is a firewall. Right now, again, we are facing the real and present threat of Donald Trump's reelection. And let me tell you what it would mean if these Republicans took control mm -hmm. of the Senate. You know that Supreme Court? The one that is going, rolling our rights back, taking affirmative action and voting rights and small business administration, trying to take that back, the 8A program for minority businesses, the same one uh, that also wants to, uh, to, to take us backwards where LGBTQ rights and other rights are concerned. Well, this next, in the next term, we believe there will be a chance to appoint up to two to three new Supreme Court justices. And let me tell you who Larry Hogan would vote for, his Republican caucus. Yes. And so when he's blessed his heart, he said he became pro-choice last month. And we, uh, we, uh, we, congratulate, we congratulate him on that epiphany, and we don't believe it, not for a second, uh, because his history says something different. But what we do know is that he's going to vote for the Senate majority leader, mm -hmm. And then he's going to vote uh, to he's also going to support the chairs of these committees like Lindsey Graham would be over judiciary. OK, so let's be clear for the people who say they like the man. Well, that was different when he was governor. We need to help the public understand the difference between governor and senator. And it is real. Yeah. It is real and very serious. And and it's and again, I want all of us to show up and tell everybody we know not only just to show up, but to show up down there with some attitude, because there are people who paid for us to be, paid for admission. The price of admission for us to vote, let me just say it one more time, was standing in front of water hoses and barking dogs, and we're never gonna forget that. No, absolutely. And I think that it's, it's imperative that when we see a trailblazer, a visionary, uh, an advocate for what is right, that we get behind, and not just give, we have to sacrifice that there is a clear distinction between giving, which come, may come easy, but sacrifice. And what sacrifice is about what going above and beyond. So as we kind of lead off into this, what is the last message that you want to kind of to say to resonate with everybody out there about what we can do to get behind you and push, uh, and push you and get to that seat? Okay, you know, I'm going to answer it in two, um, two ways. First of all, I want to, again, I don't, I don't have enough words to say thank you. You don't know how good I feel to sit in this room and that you all have taken time out on a Sunday. I also want to thank a super bad brother in this room, Lamont Riley. Where are you? Thank you, Lamont, so much. Lamont, yeah, Lamont. Lamont is, def is literally sweating today because he's put so much into this, this day. Let me say to everybody here, because the hour is short, the promise, the profound promise that I make to you is every single time they see me, they're going to see you. 
on that floor of the Senate. And I go there not only knowing what we're fighting about. I've spent the last 27 years in public service. Mm -hmm. uh, and you mentioned something about the people loving me. That's because they know I love them. Mm -hmm. And that will never change. And I promise you, every single time they see me, they will see you. And all of our issues and concerns are the ones that I'll be fighting for uh, every single day. And what you can do is just let's continue standing together, you know, to to talk to each other. And you know what? And there is no situation where we got to keep talking to each other before the election and after. Mm -hmm. So the access will be there as well. Um, because we have a lot of lot of work to do, and it means that we're going to have to listen to each other and stand together. But bring out Lottie Dottie and everybody and let them know <laughs> about this election um, and let them know also that it does make a difference. It absolutely does make a difference. The person who stood in Charlottesville after Charlottesville, after they ran over people in that racial uprising they had in Charlottesville, what did that man say? They're good people who were out there that day. Yes. Never forget it, okay, what we're talking about. And in the Senate... Uh, the same is very true, is that we have uh, we have to have people there who are the gatekeepers in making sure that that our rights are protected. Absolutely. I would definitely echo everything with Lamont, uh, what this what that brother has been able to put together in a short period of time. Uh, one of my I would be remiss if I didn't say one of my early believers very, very uh, early on, Miss Edwards, uh, when I just had the belief of concentric, it's about, you know, we have these ideas, we have this audacity to dream, and then asking people who will come with us and help yeah. us uh, push it over. And you have reaffirmed and restored my faith uh, that people actually do really care in public service. Uh, it was just within two short weeks to be able to do this. And you took your time out as well. We took our time out, but you took your time out. And you traveled up here and you made it important. And we are all behind you. We're going to make sure that we galvanize ourselves, not just from the moment, but for the journey. Uh, and then we're going to come out, we're going to show out, and we're going to support uh, and help you change not just Maryland, but this uh, uh, country. Thank you. You know, two other people, if you would allow me. You, oh, you mentioned you mentioned a super bad Tisha Edwards. How could oh, I not geez. mention? And I want you no. to know that is my sister. That is, that is my sister. Uh, Tisha's so bad, you might not, now look, you can't tell her from looking because she's, she's not a huge woman. Whoa. But she double dared some people not to support me. And I want to just thank her. She, she put up real, Senator Antonio Hayes has an infant. Uh, yes. And his infant, his infant is like a week old. Yep. And he came out here tonight with a week old baby at home. And I just thank him so much. Um, and I was saying that he and, and Councilwoman Porter, they're going to charge them with yes. crimes. They work so hard. Yes. Put these people out, they work so hard. Um, and so I want to say thank you to them. But again, to everyone who has taken time out tonight, I don't have enough words to say thank you so much. We are going somewhere with this. Um, you know what? The best is still yet to come. I believe it. We're going to knock down all kind of doors. And you know what? Remember, out of 2,000 plus senators that they have elected in this country, they have only found fit on two occasions to elect a black woman, except now. So you all are going to help us and we're going to bring our brothers right along with us uh, and make sure that we make history, but not only make history, we're going to do the important work of making sure that more of us are coming through these doors with our lived experiences uh, who can represent in our country. So, and, and Dr. Heber, thank you. Uh, also for taking time tonight for uh, for this, for moderating this, and for including me on your podcast. Really appreciate it. No, that, yeah, you're gonna make me blush. Thank you, right? Um, okay, there's so much behind the scenes, so many people sacrificing, getting things together. Um, shout out everybody oh. for the Divine Nine that Sorry. came. We got the, the two noobs are sitting together, the council of points. <laughs> You know what I mean? Councilman uh, Torrance, hey. I'm sorry, the, I'm looking, I didn't, he I'm sorry, the, Councilman Torrance. That's Torrance. what we do, we in the country yeah. and stuff like that. Um, but no, thank you all for uh, showing out uh, for my for my council, my two counselors who, who came on the podcast early on with just a text message and didn't even know who I was. Thank you. You are really supporting uh, everything that we're trying to do and get the message out. I want to thank everybody for showing up. Uh, let's make sure that we support Angela uh, in November uh, throughout that journey leading up to it. I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Uh, shout out to uh, Rock for producing this. And thank you for joining us for another episode of One Do I At A Time. We are actually wrapping up season two this time. I promise you, you can catch all of our stuff on concentric.world. 
Um, until next season, I'll see you. Please go out and let's support. Let our voices be heard. Thank you.